Well, good morning, First Baptist Simpsonville Upstate Church. Uh, man, I hope everybody is doing okay. My name is Pat. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm actually, uh, in addition to working with families, I get to be the campus pastor at our Fountain Inn campus, uh, which today would have been our uh, first day together, uh, really in the Yacht Center. We've been meeting six weeks in the North Auditorium, and today would have been our first time in the Yacht Center, but uh, because of the storms, we weren't able to do that. And so as a church, we're collectively joining uh, on this stream today. And uh, we also have several different um, prayer services that we're doing. We have three different prayer services in the chapel, downtown Simpsonville uh, campus. We also have our Haywood campus and our Five Forks campus that are meeting in that way. And so uh, you may be joining us at that time uh, right now, uh, for praying for everybody that's walked through the past couple of days. We pray and hope that you are safe and that you are okay and that things uh, are working out for you. I know many are still without power, myself included. So I'm actually running a generator uh, to uh, have lighting this morning and um, try to try to keep my fridge going. I know many of y'all are kind of uh, walking through that as well and trying to find out where you can get gas uh, to, to uh, fill that generator, fill your vehicles. It's, it's, it's really a crazy time uh, out there. And so our prayers are with you and uh, really hope that uh, this uh, comes to an end soon and that uh, the power companies are able to get the power back up and the roads cleared. And I know many uh, have had trees fall in their houses. And so uh, our team is out there working and doing a lot. There's so much of our community that's coming together. Uh, just know that we are praying uh, for you and that we care. Um, also, man, just as I said earlier, this would have been Fountain Inn's first uh, Sunday together in the Yacht Center. So we're pushing that back a week. So next week will be our first time together in the Yacht Center. We're excited about that. We're really pumped about what God is doing already. We think we probably will have uh, some baptisms even on our first public launch Sunday if we can figure out how to do the baptismal in there. So pray for us. And if you know somebody that's looking for a church in the Fountain Inn area, send them our way to our campus. Or maybe God may be calling you to join us and be a part of what God's doing uh, as our church launches a new campus into the Fountain Inn area. So I just want to extend that invitation. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, to any of us, with myself included, and, uh, and let us know how we can help or help get you plugged in. We'd love to do that. Uh, it's been really, really great the past six weeks in the North Auditorium as we've been kind of preparing um, for that time together. So, so much happening this weekend, and ideally we would all be together. Ideally, we would be on the campus, uh, but just out of caution and the fact that uh, people are still walking through difficult times with uh, no power and everything else. This is this is really how we are going to worship together as we open God's word this morning. So I thank you so much for being here. And if you will turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 7, and while you do that, I want to just kind of tell you, man, I, um, I'm a guy who, who kind of likes to, um, to, to buy gadgets, and that's kind of always been my thing and, and something that I enjoy. And sometimes people really look forward to those gadgets, and, and I used to a lot more than I do. And maybe I'm just getting old, and so I don't care as much, or maybe there's just too many gadgets. But um, when I was a kid, I, I loved, like, Inspector Gadget. I loved... Um, data on uh, Indiana Jones. Like I, lo I loved all of that stuff, right? Or short round, I should say, data on Goonies. Some of y'all are going to correct me on that. But I loved those type of, uh, of, of guys and parts on the shows because I just love to get into that stuff. And um, years ago, there was something I got really excited about. And some of y'all may even have one of these, but I got an iPod. Uh, and this is not just a regular iPod. This is actually an iPod video. So on this uh, massive uh, screen here, like a one and a half inch screen, um, I could watch movies or TV shows that I paid uh, an extreme amount of money for on Apple uh, back then, iTunes. And uh, this, this iPod, I still have one and I still have it. I mean, it was such a big deal uh, for me to own this thing back in the day. 60 gigabytes, that just paid extra for the 60 gigabytes. And it's funny when we look at old technology like this because we see how temporary it was and we see how um, it, it really didn't age well. And it seems like these years, uh, that every day, every every moment, there's a new device out that, that seems to make the last one irrelevant. Um, it seems like your phone every single year all of a sudden becomes a, a brick and you need something different. And so today what I wanna talk about is an eternal priest that never lets us down and who is constantly interceding for us. He's not some temporary fad. Jesus is not some temporary moment for us or something that we can say, hey, I'm excited about for just this 
brief second. It's actually a relationship that we get to have with God in which Jesus on our behalf is working and acting constantly and forever. And so the exciting part of Hebrews 7, as the author of Hebrews kind of moves into this discussion, is that Jesus is our eternal priest. He is not temporary. You do not need an upgrade in a year. Um, you don't have to look back and laugh at the silliness of the tech. Jesus is eternal. And so as we've been reading here in Hebrews, we've been challenged uh, by the author of Hebrews not to drift from our faith. We've been challenged to have a mature faith and one that actually honors the Lord above anything else. One that actually realizes that our faith should have substance to it. And so Hebrews 7, I feel like, leads us down that path as well. I'm going to just kind of um, walk through this together a little bit at a time if I can. And it's, it's honestly a pretty theologically deep uh, chapter for us to walk through this morning. And so I know that um, it's going to be really difficult for us to cover that. And truly, uh, even if we have the opportunity to preach on each campus, there's there's so much that we're not able to get into uh, today. But I want to do my best just to kind of uh, cover that by, let's read the first three chapters together. It says in verse one, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues to priest forever. Now, I think it's important for us to actually address the fact that the author of Hebrews brings up Melchizedek as we talk about Jesus being our, his, our eternal priest. So as we do that, I want us to take a moment and let's talk about the implications of Melchizedek and who he was and why that matters in our relationship to Jesus as our high priest. Melchizedek was actually mentioned back in Genesis chapter 14. Again, this is referenced here, but Abraham was just coming back from a, a battle and his nephew Lot had actually been taken captive and Abraham and his men had pursued those captors, defeated them and brought Lot back. And as he did that, he was actually met with Melchizedek who blessed him. Now, this is actually way before um, there were priests and systems already set up in Jewish tradition, because as you remember, God called Abraham last week. We talked about God called Abraham out of his land, and he said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations, right? He reminded him of the covenant that God was making with him. And so what we see here is actually uh, Abraham kind of almost establishing in many ways this, this offering, if you will, this fact that he tithed uh, to this priest who was known not just as a priest, but as a king of Salem. And that may sound familiar because we're familiar with Jerusalem. It's a place of peace. Now, I think it's interesting that we actually see peace and righteousness often mentioned at the same time in scripture. We cannot have peace without having true righteousness. What a, what a beautiful picture for us as we're reminded there. But I want you to know, as the Bible talks about Melchizedek, there's so many questions that people have about who this priest and this king might have been. Could he have been an angel? Um, could he have been maybe even Jesus himself? And I don't know that the Bible reveals enough information for us to know that. But what I do believe is that Melchizedek is actually a foreshadowing of what Jesus was to come. It says that Melchizedek had no genealogy. Now, when you go in the Old Testament and you see a name mentioned in the Old Testament or you see somebody brought up, there's almost always a genealogy. There's almost always, you've probably uh, read those verses before where so-and-so begat so-and-so, right? It just keeps going down the line. And, and so, um, and we should use that terminology today. You know, Patrick begat Shay and Piper. Like, we, we should just do that. I think that'd be... Uh, a weird thing for us to do. Really, don't do not do that at all. Um, but it's a foreshadowing because Melchizedek had no genealogy listed in Scripture. It doesn't mean that he lived eternally. He was a real man. What it means was we didn't know what his genealogy was, and after that moment, we don't know what happened to him. And so for lack of better description, it seems as if Melchizedek is eternal. And so we see this important foreshadowing for Jesus because his name, Melchizedek, is actually king of righteousness, king of peace. 
Those names sound familiar. They're names that actually describe who Jesus is to us, and it sounds familiar to us. And so I love this, that Melchizedek is listed as the priest perpetual, the perpetual priest, the one that we need. Now, don't forget that the author of Hebrews is writing to uh, Jews who are scattered, and he's trying to encourage them. He's trying to remind them uh, to follow Jesus and to have a mature faith. But he also knows that they know about the sacrificial system in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we see, even as Jewish uh, people would go to uh, the temple and they would sacrifice animals um, so that their sins would be forgiven. So we know that that's the case. And so um, he's writing to a group of people who understand that, and he specifically mentions Melchizedek. Now, I think this is interesting because in verse 11, as we read in chapter 7, it says, Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Now, the author of Hebrews is specifically kind of touching on one point. He's trying to say that the, the, the Levitical tribe, which is the one who, who, did, uh, who were priests and who offered those sacrifices, is not enough. It, it, it is not eternal. It is not the thing that is going to help us. And so instead of saying, let me remind you of Aaron and, and, uh, and, and the tribe of, of Levi who act on our behalf as priests and the importance of what they do, he actually goes back and says, no, we need a priest like Melchizedek, one who is eternal, one who is larger than that. In fact, no king could be a priest and no priest could be a king. There was no combination of the two, and yet Melchizedek was known as both. And so as he's pointing to Jesus and as we see the foreshadowing of Jesus through the typology of who Melchizedek was, we see this picture for us of the fact that, man, we need an eternal priest the same way Melchizedek was, who is also our king, who is also not in this broken system that is not working for us. The law of works is, is no longer good enough. The law of sacrifice was not enough. And, and the reality of that was that in the law of sacrifice, it constantly required more and more sacrifice. It constantly required another sacrifice the next day, a sacrifice the day after that. You and I uh, do not live in a perfect world, and the law itself makes nothing perfect. Let me read actually through uh, verses 15 through 19 as he says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by one power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. I love this picture as he's saying the, the, the law itself is not perfect. He even described it um, as weak and useless. That we need something more than this system because it is not functioning for us. I love this picture because God did not give us the law so that we could obey it and become perfect. He actually gave us the law to prove that we could not be perfect. And so rather than trying to say, hey, um, this is actually freeing us, the law is freeing us, the law actually exposes the fact that we are shackled. We are shackled to sin. I know years ago I knew a, a guy who's like, I'm going to follow every law. And it, man, it's tough because if you feel that way, it's first of all impossible. But second of all, the author of Hebrews is reminding us it's unprofitable and it's weak. We ourselves need to, to, to bind ourselves to Jesus, to tether ourselves. Even as we talked about last week, the anchor of our soul, Jesus would be the one that we're tethered to, not the law because the law will not carry us through. Even in verse 22, he puts it this way, where he says, this makes Jesus a guarantor of a better covenant. I love that because as we talk about Jesus being better, we're just reminded of that constantly through Hebrews. Jesus is better. And this even guarantees that more of a better covenant. Abraham got a covenant. Man, I will make your descendants like the stars of the sky. We have a better covenant. You can be free from sin because of 
our eternal priest. Even in the order of Melchizedek, not in the, the normal order of things, not in the way that's broken, but in someone who is eternal, just like the foreshadowing or the typology that Melchizedek brought to that, we can follow an eternal God who loves us and is constantly interceding on our behalf. Now, I think this is actually kind of a, a beautiful picture as we move forward. And um, I think that sometimes we, we miss the fact that that we aren't getting the full picture of what the gospel is and the fact that Jesus is our priest. And there's nothing maybe that hits me a little more realistic than the fact that we have no power right now, or um, some of y'all do have power and I'm a little jealous, but um, my whole house is automated, right? So if, if you know me, you know that when I come home, there are certain lights that automatically pop on at the house. Um, at uh, certain hours of the day, my blinds will close and other hours of the day, they will open. Um, I have, I have that, that's, I love it. Like I, like I said, I'm kind of a nerd as far as that stuff's concerned. And um, I'll tell you uh, what happens. You can have your whole house automated and then uh, a hurricane can hit and you have no power and none of that stuff works anymore. And so you go back to normal ways where you have candles or battery fla power flashlights, right? And you just have to do with what you have or you run a generator to get just a couple of things working. Now we'll say um, we did plug up the, the power recliners. That was a necessary thing. We had to do that uh, to make those work to the generator. But there's nothing like that that reminds us that we can depend on a system or we can depend on even even power functioning our house, but it will not ever be enough because it can be removed. It can fall apart. It can it can fail us. And that was what the sacrificial system was. It was never quite enough. It was never enough to cover every sin today and tomorrow. It was enough to get us by as we looked forward to a savior who would come and eternally be our priest. So I want to talk about Jesus as our high priest. The great high priest, first point, lives forever. The great high priest lives forever. I'm going to read in verses 23 and 24. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. I love this picture as we talk about it because the former priests, man, it says they couldn't last forever. They were bound even by death itself. They were bound even by life itself for their own mortality. But Jesus is not bound by that mortality. He is immortal. He is eternal. It says he uh, and his priesthood are permanent because he continues forever. Jesus lives forever. Now, I actually learned this past uh, week from uh, Zach Bray that there were 84 different high priests uh, from the time of Aaron until the destruction of the temple, which means there were 84 people who were acting as high priest on behalf of Israel at that point, offering sacrifice for the nation and moving forward. 84 that were required, 84 that eventually met their death and another one was needed to step in their place. And yet Jesus lives eternally. Jesus lives forever. He does not go out of style. He is not irrelevant. The world wants us to think that God is irrelevant. The world wants us to think that Jesus is out of style or that he needs an upgrade. And he's, this is the old school and you need to get on with the new school way of thought. But let me tell you this, that Jesus is just as relevant today as he always been. The, the message of hope that we need is the same that we have always needed in our lives. The promise of the law was, was to help us see our shackles and know that we would be destroyed by the wrath of God if it wasn't for Jesus. The promise of Jesus is that he will step in our place. Jesus, in the presence of God, is our priest. He is the one acting on our behalf, the ultimate high priest. Now, I know for myself, I'm, I'm prone to sin. My heart is prone to wander. I, I'm daily having to remind myself of my need for the gospel and my, my ultimate need and desire to follow him with my whole life. And, and so let me tell you, this, this speaks to me more than anything else, that I am thankful that Jesus is eternally on my behalf, ha having offered up himself for me to have a relationship with the Lord, because I need it. I need it today and tomorrow. And not just that, he's a personal God who, who loves me and cares about me, who, who thinks about 
me, who, who cares about who I am. I heard this story and it, you know, you read stories online, but it was about this bear that they called Joey and he was an albino grizzly bear. And, um, and so they first saw him, they thought he was a polar bear who was lost from the Arctic. So this group actually raised money and, and got stuff together to actually have Joey shipped back to the Arctic. Well, he's a grizzly bear. So he did not survive well in the Arctic. He lost a lot of weight. The polar bears there actually um, teased him and kind of picked on him. I don't know how that works in polar bear world, but that's what, they, that's what I'm told they did. And, and really kind of shunned him from the community until somebody realized his fur is different. Doesn't quite look like the other polar bear's fur and obviously he wasn't eating the way he was. And they did a genetic test and actually found he was a grizzly bear up in the Arctic. So they moved him back down uh, to his home uh, area in the woods where he could survive in his area. And guess what? Another group actually saw all this albino grizzly and had the exact same thought. I bet he's a polar bear. They moved him back up to the Arctic. And now Joey uh, realized, hey, like I've been here. This is not good for me. Just started running uh, south. Just I'm just making my way back south. I'm going to try and get back home. I don't know what's happened to me. I've been tranked and woke up in this different place a couple of times, right? And as he's running back down, these people see him and think, hey, this is a polar bear we can put in our zoo. And they they get they get Joey and they put him as a polar bear in their zoo exhibit and then realize he's actually a grizzly. I, it's a crazy story to think about how this bear has bounced back and forth and what he went through. But Jesus knows us so well. Sometimes I feel like we don't feel like we're known. We may feel like I'm like Joey, man. Nobody knows my heart. They don't know who I am. This, this uh, life is difficult. This life is challenging. I feel like I'm being misrepresented or misunderstood. And let me tell you, Jesus is our high priest who lives forever and knows you personally. He knows everything about you. He, he, he cares about you. And as our priest, he is acting on our behalf, which leads to our second thing. He saves completely. Back in verse 15, I want to read that to you. He says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. It becomes even more evident when Jesus, in that order of Melchizedek, rises to show us that he saves completely. In verse 25, he also says this, for it was indeed, or excuse me, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I love that. He is able to save to the uttermost. You're like, I don't know, Pat, you don't really know what I've walked through. And I've, I've been through a lot of stuff in my past. And if you only knew uh, the struggles I've been through, or you only know the thoughts that went through my head, or if you only knew what I did, I won't even tell my parents or my friends. Uh, let me just tell you, Jesus saves to the uttermost. There is absolutely nothing you have done or said or thought that is outside of the realm of Jesus freeing you from the bondage of that sin. The fact that he is our priest means that Jesus wants us to draw near to him. He is a God who cares about us and loves us, just as we talked about in that last point. He wants us to draw near to him. He cares about who you are, and he can save you completely. The beauty of following the gospel is recognizing and realizing not only is Jesus our priest, not only is he our king and our prophet, Jesus actually was the sacrifice for you and I that gave his life for us so that we could experience a relationship with God, so that we could know him. Jesus allows us to draw near in a world that tells us that that nearness to God is irrelevant, that he is distant and irrelevant. The gospel is the best news for us because he's not just our priest. He is also the sacrifice that stepped in our place. The third thing and the last thing is the great high priest intercedes always. Just back to that uh, verse in verse 15 uh, where he says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. He is interceding always on our behalf. Now, I don't know what if you know what interceding means, but it means someone who is standing in the gap for you. There was a time when my kids at my last house, they were very young. Uh, they were playing in the backyard, playing on a, on a swing, and uh, the neighbor's kids actually uh, came over and were gathering sticks 
from the backyard of where I, there was a bunch of trees behind my house. They were gathering sticks for their dad and they started kind of picking on my kids. And uh, you know, there's only so much you can hear as a dad before you want to do something. Um, and so, you know, you try to let your kids learn lessons. You don't want them uh, to just, just be in a bubble their whole life, but they're young kids and this other kid was picking on them and they had no clue. They were innocent and young, um, but I stepped in as a dad and I said, first of all, you tell your dad not to get sticks out of my yard. And second of all, go home and don't talk to my kids again. Like as a, as a dad, I wanted to intercede to help my kids in that situation, in a situation in which they were struggling or in a situation where I felt like um, somebody else was making fun of them. And, and I interceded on their behalf. To intercede or to make intersections, intercession means to meet, to approach, to appeal, or make a petition. And Jesus is making a constant, um, excuse me, constant petition on our behalf um, in, in, in heaven. Let me just say it this way. We need a king of righteousness because of our sin. We, we've got to have a king of peace. We, we've got to have someone who is eternal and there's no beginning or end. We, we need to have somebody that, um, that experiences life and is indestructible. We need to, to have somebody in our life that will never die and lives forever. We need somebody who is greater than the system that exists. And Jesus is all of those things. Keller actually said this one time. He said, Jesus is not in heaven asking God to forgive our sins once again. He's reminding of the Father of the sacrifice that he made for every sin that we commit. He's already paid the price. And the gospel is such a wonderful thing for us. It's a fitting thing for us to give God honor and glory because he deserves it. And it's a fitting thing for us even this morning to pause and to ask ourselves a few questions. Who's acting on your behalf? Who is the one who, who is uh, interceding for you? It may even be yourself. You may feel like, I can handle this. I can do this. I've got this on my own. Let me tell you, you need Jesus to intercede for you. You need the, the great high priest, the one who knows us better than anyone knows us, the one who has a relationship with us, the one who cares about us. You need that. And so today, if you've never made that decision, I want to encourage you to do that. Even listening to this message, even listening to Hebrews uh, being, being preached, that, that you would respond to follow Jesus with your life and say, I want him to be my great high priest because he cares. I know that he on my behalf will speak to the Father. I will not experience the wrath that I deserve because of sin, but I'll actually um, experience grace in that relationship. Let me also ask you, are you, are you playing church? Are you, are you trying to kind of fill the, the outside and make the outside look right when on the inside you really don't know who Jesus is? Jesus as our intercessor, Jesus as our high priest actually requires us to know him and to draw near to him. When's the last time you felt as if you draw near, drew near to Jesus? And then my last question for you is, are you putting your hope in temporal things? Are you putting your hope in things that don't last, things that do need upgrades? It's easy for us to put our hope in the things of this world, even people on this earth. Jesus says, put your hope in me. There is no greater one that we can trust than the great high priest. Let me challenge you and encourage you today to put all of your hope and all of your trust in him. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you for this morning and the privilege that we had to open your word. And Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts, even in this unique way. And even as we struggle uh, to get back to what life as normal may be uh, here in the upstate, will you remind us that even with all those things ripped away, you are still enough. But not just that you are enough, but you are better. And so this morning we lean on you and we love you. God, I pray that you would protect everybody who is struggling. I pray that you would uh, watch after those who are walking through difficult things or um, expensive uh, recoveries or even somebody that may have been injured with this. That God, I pray that you would uh, put your hand on them and heal them. I pray that you would help them, that you would uh, surround them with their groups or uh, with the community that cares about them so that we can see them bring glory to you. And in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of all of it, God, we just want to bring all glory to you because you deserve it. In Jesus' name.